Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining um, this morning. I know it's early for some. Uh, my name is Kevin Martelli. I'm a principal um, advanced uh, technologies cloud leader at uh, KPMG, overseeing a lot of our cloud innovation, um, ML ops, and, and pipeline. So nice to meet everyone virtually today. Evan, all? Yeah, sure. Hey, thanks a lot, Kevin. I think so. Um, yeah, thanks for joining the session today. My name is Abhinav Joshi. I'm a senior manager in the OpenShift product marketing team at Red Hat. I have over yeah, 20 years of industry experience in a, like, a lot of roles on both the customer side as well as on the vendor side. In my current role at Red Hat, me and my team, so we focus on uh, building out and uh, being able to evangelize the value of Red Hat OpenShift, industry uh, leading Kubernetes platform with the integrated uh, DevOps capabilities for cloud native workloads that also includes the emerging uh, technologies like uh, data analytics, AI, ML, and so on. So back to you, Kevin. I'm looking forward to the talk today. Thank you, Evan. So before we get started in today's talk track around ML ops, I wanted to give a brief background around KPMG. Uh, many of you may know KPMG is one of the big four consultancies and advisory firms. Um, and within our advisory practice, we have a group of practitioners around 2,500 or so located in multiple countries where we really focus in on maximizing the value from data, AI, <clears throat> and emerging technologies. We do this both from our internal enablement as well as we support our clients in their journey in this space. In addition, we have partnerships with many um, core technology partners, you know, IBM and, and Red Hat and, and Microsoft and Oracle to name a few, uh, but these ecosystems allow us to, again, accelerate our client's journey in the emerging tech space. So today, the, the goal of this talk track is around ML ops. And, and the way that we want to show you what ML ops is and how KPMG solves for it internally, as well as how we solve for it with our clients, is we're going to be doing a, a, a deep walkthrough, both at a business process level, as well as a technical level of our patented approved platform called KPMG Ignite. Um, first, we'll give you a little bit of a background around what KPMG Ignite um, is. We'll talk through, you know, who is using Ignite, um, why they're using it, and then we'll drill into some specific challenges Ignite is used to solve for. We'll also talk a little bit about use cases, and then finally, we'll get into the meat of the presentation around how Ignite solves for the problem of ML ops, both from a process perspective as well as a technology perspective. So KPMG Ignite initially was built to extract value out of unstructured data. So we saw the need with unstructured data sets, predominantly contract documents, loan documents, um, emails, voice, et cetera. But there's a big need early on in the days of machine learning where values need to be extracted out of unstructured data. And that's really where KPMG Ignite started its, its, um, its generation, if you will. And, and over time, it, it took in unstructured data as well. It's a platform that's built in a modular form, uh, really based on open source. Uh, with the containerization, such as OpenShift running it, um, and open architecture. This gives it the flexibility to evolve over time and take in new tooling as, as the market demands. And finally, who's the platform for? Initially, it was for uh, data scientists and engineers, but you'll see a lot of hooks where business users can come into play and also integrate within the platform. So Ignite solves many of the end-to-end -end challenges that enterprise face from taking you know, POCs or pilots into production at the ML use case uh, level. However, when we think about the ops perspective and where does ML ops and what types of challenges does Ignite solve, it solves through you know, different, different areas, whether it's pre-deployment, deployment, and post-deployment. In the, in the pre-deployment space, it provides a robust set of tools, uh, AI tools that is enabled for data scientists to run their experiments, um, enabling for risk management teams to see the outputs and the results and explainability of models. Um, it's ready to scale training infrastructure, being on, built on top of containerizations allows you to scale out on your training needs. Artifact and version management has the ability to store the metrics associated to models. And then finally, there's some new feature sets under development around explainability and surrogate or alternative models that can be used to get through your governance processes. In the deployment phase of, of Ignite, many things it solves for the models as well around automatic infrastructure provisioning, you know, heterogeneous model deployment environments, multi-tenancies, and again, the hook into your model risk management and governance processes. 
And then finally around the post-deployment, you know, some of the more important things here, I think, are the, the logging and alerting, you know, after the fact to keep track of the model, um, the scalability to be able to scale the platform on demand based on the specific needs, the integration into a CICD pipeline, and overall performance monitoring and, 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 and health metrics. So Ignite itself is, the concept of Ignite is to build use cases and or solutions. Um, use cases and solutions are really built by stringing together what we call components. You can think of a component as an individual piece of work or functionality to achieve some type of solution or use case. Um, a component can almost be anonymous to a microservice. Components can be something that is custom built, maybe something KPMG built and their IP is there, and that could be maybe an anomaly detection model here at the bottom. Uh, it may be something that is an open source uh, type of capability in the marketplace today, maybe like Tesseract for OCRing. Or it could be something that comes from a third party, like a proprietary type of algorithm, something maybe for speech to text that you may be able to get off of a CSP provider. But at the end of the day, the components are the smallest piece of work effort that strung together into a workflow will produce a solution. And all along the way, the ability for the human in the loop to be able to evaluate the outputs that's coming out to determine if the models are in fact predicting accurately or over time making changes so retraining can go into the process. The human in a loop also extends to other groups in an organization. It could expand to the governance team that needs to see the, the metrics that are a part of the model. It can expand to the operational team for the deployment and the health of the system. And we'll go into some of those details. But again, at a high level, the solutions are made up of many components that are individually pieced together into a workflow that will then produce an output. So Ignite itself solves for many different types of use cases. I'm not gonna go into each individual use case that you see here on the slide, but as you can see, a lot of these use cases are around unstructured data. The first three are more around contractual terms and, and PDF documents. The last one is around you know, KPMG intelligence interaction, which is the, the chatbot types of interaction. I'll take one use case here as an example. In, in cognitive contract management, one of the challenges that we see organizations facing is that they have a ton of contracts out there and being able to get the right information out of these contracts to make the right business decisions. So for instance, are vendors compliant to terms and conditions? Are payments being paid on time? Any type of information that you think is relevant as part of you know, your contracting process, Ignite can help break the contract down into usable pieces that will ultimately give you an answer to be able to determine the next steps. Similar for LIBOR analytics, the LIBOR rate is going away shortly, and there's a lot of um, need to change these rates in, in, in documents. What are your alternatives? You have to understand the documents and figure out, figure, and figure out what it, you can replace the LIBOR rate with. Um, and this is another one of the use cases where it breaks down into components, maybe OCRing a document, you know, breaking it down into sections, using some rule-based inferences, maybe using classification models to determine what type of options are available. <clears throat> and, and, and as we mentioned before, you know, open source and Red Hat are really the foundational pieces for what makes up the Ignite platform. And open source was really chosen because of its you know, cutting edge algorithms, its ability to scale massive models. You know, I think we can all under, agree to the, the, the innovation that takes place. So foundationally, open source was you know, a core, core tenant of what the Ignite platform you know, needed to be. And then partnering in conjunction with Red Hat, Red Hat provided it the containerization environment, which gave us the ability to, to scale massively, consistency anywhere, enhance security and controls, as well as the robust CICD pipeline. You put these two together as part of the overall you know, Ignite platform and the foundational pieces that run it from the containerization it's an achievable path um, that we're able to bring AI applications into production in a quick and fast way. I think a lot of us have experienced the challenges of creating a, a, a pilot or a POC successfully, but it's been, you'd spend months and months getting that POC into production because there's a lot of processes and controls and things that may not have been considered specifically around the model, the ML ops management. And we're gonna dive into the details specifically, you know, how, how it might solve for that. But before that, share a little bit of information around uh, Red Hat. Everyone? Hey, thanks so much, Evan. 
So before I talk about OpenShift, I wanted to uh, talk about the fundamental uh, value that containers, Kubernetes, and the DevOps operational uh, practices provide for the AIML workflows. These uh, technologies and the operational best practices uh, uh, provide the much needed the, uh, the agility, flexibility, portability, and the scalability for the data scientists to build to develop, iterate, and share the models with the peers in a seamless way, uh, and, and as well as with the software the developers as well. And then for the developers, uh, so they get the capabilities to be able to uh, do a rapid um, coding of the soft software apps that are powered by the machine learning and the deep learning models. Uh, and the data scientists and the developers are no longer um, have a dependency on IT of, on, on IT ops for every the infrastructure provisioning task. And next slide, Kevin. To execute on the AI workflows, what you need is uh, like a bunch of software tools um, yeah, such as, uh, say, uh, TensorFlow, uh, Spark, PyTorch, yeah, Jupyter yeah, Notebooks, and so on, and the data services like the data you know, streaming technologies, like say Kafka, SQL, and NoSQL you know, databases. It could be uh, object you know, storage uh, and so on. And then uh, what you need is uh, you know, the end-to-end -end, you know, uh, solution architecture. It may sp uh, you know, span across like, like on-premises, in the cloud, and you know, all the way to the edge for the various needs. Yeah, such as the security and compliance, the data generation at the edge, the data gravity, and so on. And, and, and all these uh, tools um, and uh, access to the data uh, sources uh, should be ideally supported on a self-service hybrid cloud platform that is able to encapsulate all these infrastructure uh, endpoints and also provide the consistency and the scalability anywhere. Now the hybrid cloud platform should have the integration with the hardware accelerators, such as the NVIDIA GPUs, to be able to speed up the data analytics, the model training, as well as the inferencing activities. Finally, the hybrid cloud platform should be able to offer the consistent experience across like on-premises, public clouds, and the edge, um, and be able to efficiently manage in a unified way by the IT operation. So OpenShift, built on the containers, Kubernetes, and the DevOps yeah, principles, is the industry-leading yeah, open uh, hybrid cloud platform uh, that has been yeah, chosen by many organizations, yeah, such as KPMG, to be able to provide these capabilities and be able to accelerate the AIML lifecycle. Uh, it, it has uh, it empowered the data scientists, the data engineers, and the developers to be agile and be like very uh, collaborative you know, throughout the AI uh, life cycle, um, and you know, without um, like having a dependency too much on the IT operations for the individual activities. Kevin, can you go to the next slide, please? Yep. So OpenShift it, it provides. Like, like a lot more than the fundamental value that we that I to get with the containers and Kubernetes. The first thing is it actually uh, simplifies the deployment, scaling, and the lifecycle management of the containerized AIML tools, such as um, the few of the examples that you see on the screen here and a lot more. Uh, by being able to automate the day one to two operation uh, tasks that are associated with these tools, uh, and, and this helps uh, ensure the high availability and the faster time to value. The second key thing is uh, integration with the hardware uh, accelerator, such as the NVIDIA GPUs uh, using the Kubernetes operator uh, concept, is ensures that the modeling and the inferencing tasks can be uh, can uh, seamlessly consume the GPUs uh, for the data scientists and the data engineers uh, directly from OpenShift. The third key thing is, uh, yeah, the OpenShift, yeah, it, it comes with a self-managed as well as the cloud-hosted option. And this actually like helps you get a consistent way to be able to perform the day one to two of ops, um, be it on-prem, at the edge, or in the public cloud, 
uh, and also providing the much uh, needed uh, portability and the consistency of the modeling and, and the app dev workflows. Uh, yeah, well, say for the data gathering, the preparation, modeling, the deployment, and the inferencing uh, task. Yeah, and then, um, like as I mentioned earlier, so OpenShift also comes with the integrated uh, DevOps capabilities. Uh, that way, yeah, it, it actually helps uh, extend the value of DevOps for the entire machine learning life cycle, uh, and, and that helps the collaboration between the teams. And, and this helps ensure that the models can be like easily deployed in the app dev processes uh, and the rollout of the ML powered intelligent applications. And then finally, OpenShift is a fully integrated like hybrid cloud platform. And it includes all the key capabilities like the monitoring, automation, the DevOps tool chain, the pipeline, GitOps, and so on. Um, and, and all this is uh, built on 100% open source uh, technology. And, and, and this helps uh, drive the innovation uh, without having a lock-in. So back to you, Kevin, to dive uh, yeah, deeper into the Ignite platforms. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um So as we kind of set up a little bit of the, the lead-in now, we're, we're gonna dive into some of the, the technical details on how we are solving, as I mentioned, from both the KPMG perspective as well for our clients around the entire ML ops um, life cycle. The, if we look at the platform itself, the, the, the KPMG Ignite platform, it's, it's made up of many, what I would call sort of your infrastructure components. And these are things that you'll see up here at the, at the, at the top box here. And, and these infrastructure components are ones that are continuously running on the, um, the OpenShift platform and are intaking the use cases or the components that string together to form a use case from an execution perspective. I'll call out some of these components that you know, I think are relevant to the overall understanding of the platform. Um, but for, for the rest of the presentation, we're really gonna be spending most of our time around the model management capabilities of the platform itself. Um, as mentioned, if you look at the bottom layer, this is run on top of Red Hat OpenShift from a containerization and orchestration perspective. Having all gave some answers around you know, the advantages of using OpenShift and these types of solutions. In addition, the full embedded CI CD pipeline is, is there. And then we also have a, an abstraction or a, a layer called MinIO, which we're using from an, an object storage perspective. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a technology layer that, that achieves the same level of object storage that you would you know, see on, on cloud providers for quick access and, and read and write times. At the component level, there's a few things, again, that I think are important to call out. One is the workflow engine. We mentioned a little bit earlier is the workflow engine are nothing more than a component and a component is a microservice and or a piece of work. So it could be a data ingestion, um, document classification, um, some type of data extraction. These types of components come together to form a workflow and they can, they can split off or they can be a linear based on your use case. And as these workflows are, are, are executed, um, the, the output of that particular solution is generated and everything is coming through which is a RESTful service of the Ignite API. So a workflow can come in through the API to say execute a certain workflow, or the AP or the um, UIs that we have can also come through the, the workflow. Some of the other components or important parts, I think, again, are the model management pieces, which I think we'll drill more into later on around how do we store the model metrics? How do we deploy the models? How do we get explainability and surrogate models? How does all this come into play? So it's not only the, the technology enablement, but it's the business process, it's the risk processes, and it's the business users integrating with the end-to-end -end process to make this successful. And we'll go into how that works. Um, there's the message controller, which is Kafka. So as components are done in your, um, in, in your particular workflow, it notifies Kafka that this component is done, start the next one. And the nice part about using the OpenShift platform is that each one of these con containers can be spun up one or n amount of time. So if you have a container that's a little bit heavier, maybe an OCR container, you might wanna run 50 instances of that, where if you're doing something with less compute, maybe it's only a few instances of that container. And within the ecosystem, uh, the Kafka sort of keeps track of the messaging and know which container needs to go next. As I mentioned, there's coder development environments through, through notebooks. Um, log and storage, you know, Elasticsearch storing some of your model statistics after it. And then if you need um, time series databases like Prometheus that may be relevant for some of your model um, monitoring processes. 
um, and then ultimately Zookeeper. But this is this is the the the, the component level view of what the Ignite um, platform itself looks like. And then one more view we'll show you of the overall Ignite platform, and then drill into the the the, the pieces of the the ML ops. Uh, is the platform itself, you know, as mentioned, is everything comes through our authentication or our API gateway. Um, the API gateway can has two two ways it can come in. One is you can come in as a as an end user through an interface, which has a lot of interface controls that we'll talk about or interface applications. And then the other way is through a RESTful service. When you're sending a, a particular um, workflow through uh, the RESTful service, think of the workflow again as being a strung together of components. Those components come into a particular order of how that workflow needs to execute. That workflow it's stored inside of a, a database in Postgres as a metadata, and then as it's stored in that particular database, you know it comes through and it will then start to actually execute and expand out on the ecosystem. So the Ignite component builder understands the workflow, understands the components associated to that workflow, and then will pull it out of the artifactory or your your registry or factory registry and deploy those components onto the platform. And again, those components are completely dynamic based on the need for that particular use case of how many times that component needs to be instantiated. If the component has a model, it will then go through through the model manager. It will retrieve the model that sits in ML flow and pull and load the model into that component. And again, it can launch, it can launch that component one to n at times based on, again, how many documents or how much data needs to go through that model for prediction. And outside of the platform, you'll see it's run on top of OpenShift. There's orchestration capabilities that may need to be put into place. And then where is the consuming documents or the consuming input for the process and then the consuming output? Now, getting down into sort of the meat of the overall topic area and conversation is, is, is what, a, what the talk track was around MLOps. Now, when we think about MLOps, MLOps has many different functionality that's needed to be built such as model training, model serving, you know, ML model management. In addition, there's a lot of business processes that also come into play. And we're gonna drill into each one of these content areas. But if you think about model training, there needs to be a place for your data scientists to run train, to, to do training, to run experiments. Um, there needs to be a place for your governance team to understand the model attributes that are being generated. Are they aligned to kind of expectations? Is there bias in your model? Are you getting the right, you know, output for, for what the, the parameters need to be. Um, then there's the serving part. I need to serve this model into the ecosystem. How do I serve it? How do I consume it? Can I serve one model? Does it can be multiple models based on scale? And then finally, the, the management part of it. How do people come in and management? And again, how do I create training data? How do I evaluate the model results? How does my governance and risk team get comfort that the model, in fact, is appropriate? All these different pieces need to come into play to have your full end-to-end -end model lifecycle. So if we think about model training, Ignite supports two mechanisms for model training. The first mechanism is you can bring your own model. So maybe you built your model somewhere else and you wanna bring it into the Ignite ecosystem. Uh, the second part, maybe you're a data scientist that wants to build a model using the Ignite ecosystem. So Ignite has Jupyter Hubs. It instantiates a notebook for each individual developer. A developer can then use that notebook to build those models. Those models have a, have a, a wrapper layer that we call Ignite Model Manager, which is a custom built component. That model manager functions in two ways, whether you're bringing your own model in or if you're using you know, your own notebook in the platform to develop it. The Ignite Model Manager can then send the relevant attributes into MLflow. So things that you may want to capture, and this metadata is very flexible. You know, some clients want to capture the training data. So there's metadata to where the training data was. If you're running classification models, you may want to capture the accuracy, you know, the precision, the F1 scores. If you're running regression models, maybe the mean square error. So based on what you're doing and based on what you want and based on what your governance processes are, a lot of different metrics can be captured as part of your model. Um, all these metrics and all the data and the model itself is all, again, persisted in a persistent volume uh, via uh, the MinIO, and they're also backed up into Artifactory. Another, um, another part that, that the, the model, Ignite Model Manager also does, which is currently under, under development or enhancement features, is there's a lot of asks that we're seeing from our clients to have explainability. 
you know, what is going on in the black box? So I'm gonna get comfort that the, that the information that's coming out of it is in fact stuff that we're expecting or, or how do we, how does our risk processes gain comfort to move into production? So explainability, we see that as becoming a, a pretty big topic and adding capabilities and features into that. Um, another thing is model alternatives. Are we using a very complex deep learning model? Can we replace that with something less complex and still get the same level of accuracy? These are all things we see that the business is asking for um, and, and how they can get these models you know, moved into production quicker in a more um, you know, governed process. The next is around model ops and model serving. So how do these models get served into the Ignite platform? We saw the high level flow on the prior page, but just to kind of walk you through the use case, um, as we mentioned before, a workflow is made up of components and components strung together in a workflow is a solution or a use case. So if we take this particular example, there will be some type of service, whether it's an application or a user that will initiate a workflow. They'll say, please run these components in these ways. The workflow will come through the Ignite platform. And this is an example of, you know, maybe a, a demonstrated workflow where we're doing OCR, we're doing template matching, machine translation, et cetera. This could be anything that, that you want to do as part of your workflow, data extraction, you know, anomaly detection model, et cetera. Um, but the idea is if it comes at a time, and these are all containers, so you know, part of that process of the deployment, which I think makes you know the OpenShift um, platform and the, the, the containerization very uh, unique and quick, is that these containers are sitting inside your, your artifact or your registry. And only at the time of workflow execution do these containers get pulled down into the platform to run and they scale based on the needs of that particular, um, I guess, function, if you will. So let's say, for instance, you're going through your workflow. These are the components. Your containers are being pulled out of your registry. You're having an OCR component running, maybe one to end, your template matching, machine translation. All these components are running. They're notifying Kafka back and forth that they're complete. And the next component is picking up on that activity. Now you get to a point where you need to run a classification model. Well, as part of this classification model run, what will happen is through this Ignite component or Ignite model manager, um, or through the Ignite model manager, it will integrate into your MinIO where your model is stored. It will have the right JSON, it will pull the right value, and then it will pull the data through into your component and then load it into your component. And your component for this classification model, maybe it's one instantiation or one container, or maybe it's 100 containers that need to run. Based on that, you're loading the model in real time into your classification container, executing that, and then you're passing the, the results to the next step. In this case, it's data visualization. So the main, you know, the main areas or the main points of this is you're getting real-time model loading during runtime. So it's picking up the most recent model um, based on your parameterization of what model version you want to pick during the actual runtime of the use case, which can change. Um, your scale model. Um, you know, based on the needs. And finally, it's outputting a lot of the model metrics as well as part of your runtime evaluation. So any metrics that you want to capture, you know, could be stored as JSON, could be stored in a time series, you know, database like Prometheus based on the types of models, but all these metrics are going to be stored. So over time, you can review those metrics to determine what type of changes you need to make. Now, the, the, the next part around here is what I think is one of the most important parts, which is the um, the ML ops management. And, and the ML ops, ma ML ops management is the dashboarding area where many different types of business users can come in to evaluate the process and the end. And we talked through some of the ability to train models and serve models, but that's you know probably a very small piece of the, the puzzle. Once you get done that and you want to get something into production, there's a lot more work that needs to get around that. So what is this management console that, that, that is put together? So some of the stuff that it does is it helps provide the businesses to create training data. Um, so training data and labeling the data, as we all know, is a huge problem um, for businesses to do. There's different techniques on how to create this labeled data. You know, Some companies like AWS will actually create it for you, but this is a big problem. But there's, there's, there's hooks for the business to create this training data. Also, as we talked about earlier, there's a lot of challenges in the governance process. What we traditionally find is, you know, the governance teams will take legacy ways of um, approving models, maybe past financial models done in different tools, and apply those same techniques to these more advanced models that may not be trying to solve the same business problem. And sometimes the governance processes become a little bit more challenging. So it's good to understand the types of metrics and data points that they want to capture 
So that's all part of your end-to-end -end ML ops lifecycle. In addition, we're seeing a lot of you know, wants and needs around how these models are working for the governance team. Can you provide ways that the explainability can gain better insights so they get better comfort on how these predictions are actually occurring? And maybe there's not biases in our algorithm or we're not, we're, we're, our, our data is not skewed. So the explainability is becoming another very you know, critical piece for how the governance team wants to work with that. You know, in addition, there's the pieces where the evaluation of the training results. So the businesses have the opportunities both during the, the training time to say, know that this is right or this is wrong and update the new value to give to the data scientist. And then also over time, right? Over time, as you're looking at the models, predictions and the different um, uh, scores and metrics that you're capturing, it's important for those business teams to also be able to um, understand that. So over time, they can feed it back into the loop to be able to get better and smarter models through that process. Um, and this next slide here, it talks a little bit about what many of us have probably seen. It's a traditional CI um, CD pipeline. And probably not a whole lot here, I would say, is different than what you've seen in before. You know, the ability for developers to put their um, information into some type of repository like GitLab or Bitbucket, having the ability to trigger it through something like Jenkins and build it if you're using maybe like Red Hat OpenShift to build it to store that container image, to go through the right scanning processes, testing, et cetera. But one of the interesting um, points I wanted to call out over here to the right is the, is the CD part of it. So as the Ignite infrastructure, the CD part is pretty straightforward as we talked about before. You have the ability to deploy you know, Kafka or Postgres or different componentries into the ecosystem. But there's also um, a deployment, probably not your traditional, um, you're not, not your traditional CI, CD, but none of the containers or and none of the um, you know components that make up a use case are deployed inside Ignite until runtime, until someone calls that particular workflow. So once someone calls that particular workflow, this Ignite component builder, what it does is it it, it reaches out into the artifactory um, or into JFrog wherever you're storing your your information. It will pull that container. So say it's pulling a classification model. And then based on pulling that model, based on the workflow inputs, it will know how many of those containers it needs to instantiate onto the cluster. So again, it could be one to N number of containers that are running that model or that component to run. And the Ignite Component Builder is continuously deploying images that are, or containers that are part of a workflow um, to run on top of the environment. So I think this is a, a pretty a good aspect of the platform and that we're not constantly running these different things, but really only when it's required and when the workloads are needed. And then down here, you'll see just some traditional tools around, you know, scanning, storing, you know, triggering the process, and then how, how we're moving both from the this code repository to the registry into the environment. Okay, so with that, I just wanted to kind of touch on a few of the key takeaways that, that we found important as we went through this. And, and one is, you know, we kind of hit on this a little bit too, is make sure your business processes keep up with the technology needs. And, and, and what I mean there is that um, we have a lot of processes today that businesses are um, working against that help them move models into production. A lot of these may have been more traditional financial service types of models that aren't necessarily the same as the type of models that we're building today. So it's important that as we're building these new capabilities, we still have the right governance and controls in place, but how do those business processes evolve just like the technologies themselves are evolving? And sometimes we're, we're pushing legacy processes against newer ways, which can, can cause a little bit of a challenge. The second one here to, to, to call out is containers, Kubernetes, and the DevOps powered by a hybrid cloud. And what this means is that there's so many places we can build these advanced analytical models. We can build them on-prem, we can build them in you know, any number of CSP providers, how do we keep an ecosystem that is, is easy and quick to bring something from pile to production? Well, through containerization, through OpenShift, you have the ability to have a consistent way of deploying these models in any environment that you're using, whether it's a cloud or on-prem. And, and this third one here is one, is one that I, I like as well. It's to leverage an open and layered architecture. And what we mean is that, you know, as we know, every day there's a new piece of technology coming out and a new tool that we want to test out and try. How do you keep your architecture flexible enough and open enough that you can plug and play these new capabilities and at the same time expand out your architecture? Because 
you're never going to get everything the first go around. It's going to need to expand to have new capabilities. So being flexible and open to be able to plug and play new component trees, um, as well as being layered so you can build upon the foundation is, is really important. Um, and then the fourth one here is the integrated training and up upskill of technical business teams. So these are newer technologies, newer ways to operate, kind of goes back to point number one, but training your teams, getting your teams up to speed. And it's not just the technical side, you know, it's really important to have the business teams aligned to this as well. So with that, I don't have any other um, slides. I don't, know, I don't know if you have anything that you want to add. So I think that was great. Um, I think there were a couple of questions in the chat. Let me um, read those out. Uh, there's a question from Praveen, and the question is, do you have a security layer on the model saved in MinIO? Do you use a few specific formats or extensions to save the model? For example, a dot pickle format is not as advisable due to security reasons as, as against ONX. Um, etc. It's a good, it's a good, it's a good question. I would say that that's something that we could probably enhance upon from the security paradigm. A lot of these are run as batch processing, so there's controls on the outside, but the RBAC controls themselves, specifically in the model, specifically to ML flow, is more controlled through the Ignite pipeline and then through the model IDs that are stored inside of ML flow. We're not using native ML flow capabilities from an RBAC perspective, but I will say it's probably not as secured. As, as one would want in, 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 in some of the enterprises? That's a good question. Cool, thanks a lot, Kevin. There is one more question um, in terms of, of the ML flow. Like, like is this the ML flow from yeah, Databricks? That's mm -hmm. the question. Uh, that's, a, that's a really, really good question. So this is not the ML flow from Databricks. That's only available through the Databricks um, ecosystems on the cloud. And one of the challenges that we experienced with MLflow um, was the ability to serve models. It, it, it's not very robust to serve the model into the production pipeline. You may want to use something like Qflow, or as you've seen, we created a custom connector, which we call Ignite Connect, which is leveraged to serve the model. So it's not one and of the same. Um, Databricks did put some hardening around MLflow and does give you the flexibility to deploy those models um, in production via the MLflow and the Databricks enhancement, but MLflow out of box doesn't support, you know, the deployment of models um, easily in a scalable way. Cool, thanks, Kevin. I think those were the key questions that I saw in the chat that were not answered. So I think we're good from the Q&A perspective. Thanks a lot, Lord. All. Um, I hope you learned something new. So, Kevin, do you want to say anything to kind of close things out? Um, no, I just really appreciate everyone spending the time here. And, and, and like I said, I think I think our journey around ML ops, AI ops, whatever we want to call it, has evolved considerably. Um, first, it was really just kind of getting the model out there and embedding it into our code base, which, which really didn't become, which really wasn't advantageous. And then we evolved into what we had today. I think by doing this and doing it in other large organizations, we find it meets a lot of the needs. Um, however, I see where the biggest gap in this whole entire process is still around the explainability um of ai and how how well can that can we explain it to give comfort over the regulators and the governance teams to, to move some of these models forward so i see that as being one of the biggest challenges still yet to solve 